Welcome, Dr. Paula Ferrada. Dr. Ferrada is professor of, of surgery at Virginia Commonwealth, where she also heads the uh, surgical and critical care ICU. Um, Dr. Ferrada is the chair of the Young Fellows Association of the American College of Surgeons. Welcome, Dr. Ferrada. Thank you, sir, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thanks for sharing your, your wealth of knowledge uh, with us. Uh, you're also a, a social media guru and, and celebrity, so I'm sure this message will get out to a lot of people outside of, of the United States, uh, around the world, especially in the world of trauma. Perhaps you could first tell us a little bit about the uh, composition and, and purpose, the mission of the Young Fellows Association, given that many of the viewers uh, are not necessarily surgeons in the U.S. or familiar with the YFA. Right. Well, so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to share this time with you, sir, um, and with everybody that has the opportunity to listen to these um, interviews. So the YFA, Young Fellows Association, is everybody that is younger than 45 years old and belongs to American College of Surgeons. So if you are, if you just became an initiate and you're older than 45, you also belong to the YFA for five years. So we represent that um, initial, the a breath of people that just became, uh, a, you became an initiate and you are part of the American College of Surgeons. You might not know that you're part of the Young Fellows Association because you don't feel as young or it's because you're younger than 40, you're not younger than 45, but you are part of us. And what we do is that we try to represent you and make sure that you have a voice in all the matters that are uh, pertaining to the American College of Surgeons. We try to increase the opportunities for the young people in the program committee, in the, in the, um, in the Congress. We try to also represent the interest throughout the year because the American College of Surgeons is a, um, an organization that is not only about the Congress, it's throughout the year supporting surgeons everywhere. So towards that end, how are you supporting your constituency and the college overall, but particularly the uh, people who are members of the YFA during this COVID-19 crisis? Perhaps you could speak a little bit about educational initiatives. There's a lot of cross-training that's going on where people are learning refreshers on how to uh, intubate or help manage ventilators, whatever the case may be. You're certainly doing it every day as head of surgical, you know, surgical critical care, but how are you working with fellows who've been out, members who've been out of training for five to 10 years, perhaps they're breast oncologists, perhaps they're plastic surgeons. How are you helping those people obtain resources and learn how they can best uh, assist our patients during this crisis? Right. So I am very proud. This is not only YFA. I think in general, the American College of Surgeons has done an amazing job right now, uh, basically focusing all the energies in how to support surgeons, young surgeons, especially because we're boots on the ground, but everybody uh, to tell, help take care of these patients. Um, we can see a couple of newsletters ago, there was a link to the, to the surgical critical care module. So people that are not as familiar to to the things that they learn in residency, they can refresh in how to take care of these sick patients. And um, yeah, multiple layers that it's also important to support them, not only as take care providers for the patients, but taking care of yourself in this moment of stress. This, um, I think, pandemic has affected us all differently, right? There's some surgeons, like trauma surgeons, that cannot stop working. In fact, that they became the, the intensive is taking care of these people. And some other surgeons that cannot stop operating, such as transplant and cancer, it just has been affecting people in different ways. And that's it's excellent information. But on, on a perhaps a um, level of surgeons helping each other. When people are soon out of training, they tend to have a network of other people with whom they've trained. It, are any efforts being made that if surgeons in New York need more help, the surgeons from a, an area that's less involved with COVID-19 are going to New York to help? Is, is YFA engaged in any kind of an effort to help people find places to volunteer where they're needed? Right now, we don't have a specific place for YFA, but the American College of Surgeons, as you know, has the list from the people that have been involved in Operation Giving Back and trying to help uh, the places where the search is more such as New 
New York and um, and uh, Washington State. I also think there's a level of anxiety and it's still people, we don't still don't know exactly how it's going to impact other places. We know that New York right now is the epicenter, but uh, but the the virus and how people are are, are, are getting um, exposed and, and sick is trickling down. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, we had no patients now in Virginia. Now we are up to um, uh, 2,050 deaths. So I think, I think um, a lot of people at this point probably do want to volunteer, but they're still, they're still an unknown and how much are they going to be needed in their local hospitals and um, in their capacity um, as uh, workers for their institutions. Another concern that people have, and, and again, at all stages of life, certainly, but, but financial, and uh, people who are in the YFA category, mm -hmm. uh, they may still be indebted for medical school loans, perhaps even undergraduate school loans. Maybe they just purchased a house. They have young kids. And so are, are you aware of any sort of individual resources that people can find to, to help out in this situation? We're asking, for example, again, just not to pick on any given specialty, but uh, a breast oncologist or, or, or a plastic surgeon, not a trauma surgeon, a colorectal surgeon like me, now suddenly no longer doing endoscopy and corrective right. cases. How do they manage? I think that's an excellent point. And I think that that's a point. The financial issue is going to affect young surgeons mostly, I think because of the things that you just pointed out, the, um, the uh, medical school debt, everything else that is, um, and not only in terms of uh, mo money and, and, and financial issues, but also practice issues. If you just graduated out of uh, your fellowship, that's the time in your life where you're going to be, you want to be busy, you want to be exposed, you want to be doing the heart operations. And now that opportunity is taken away because of this pandemic. I think we're going to have to together really support these surgeons not only finding economical um, uh, ways and then some institutions right now I'm I'm not aware of something nationally uh, that has been targeting young surgeons I think some institutions have managed this better than others some institutions have like uh, uh, cha changed from RVU base into just freezing salaries and letting people work for what and be part of the workforce and then some institutions have not been very supportive of surgeons overall in the country and I think what some of the lessons that we're going to learn after this pandemic is how to support our surgeons in all um, in our own levels, not only financially, but educationally. It is a concern. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier about wellness and taking care. Any, any specific advice for maintaining uh, wellness during this crisis? Right. So I think is I, um, many wellness is such a broad perspective, right? I think uh, I applaud some organizations like the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma and the American College of Surgeons releasing the statement against um, uh, discrimination and, you know, being in the right side of history, uh, protecting the people that need more protection and helping um, everybody do their best job. I think that that's some part of wellness. I think the other part of wellness is, um, you know, thinking about how we go by not being deprived of our friends and family, but at the same time protecting them um, from these uh, infectious problems, infectious disease. Um, checking, you know, checking on each other and checking on yourself and make sure that you're able to um, not only physically cough and fever and actually um, symptoms, but symptoms of burnout. Um, I think is really important for now for us that we're in the workforce and in the front lines to not lose hope. There are many things that we're gonna be seeing during this uh, pandemic, good things and bad things. I think we, the important thing is to remember the good things, right? The good things about humanity and, and take those lessons with you. Good, it's very sage advice. Um, the, the other area I'd like to touch upon isn't necessarily your role in YFA, but your role as a leader at your institution heading the surgical ICU critical care. Um, how are you working with your physicians there to get them ready, your surgeons there? You haven't yet had the surge, though it sounds like it's starting. Right. In terms of retraining people, freeing up beds, finding space. Maybe you could talk about the logistics in your hospital uh, as the trauma surgeons clearly are going to take the lead. 
Right, right. So I think that that's a great point. Trauma surgeons everywhere have been very involved in how to deal with, this is basically a, a disaster situation. We didn't go to a disaster, the disaster came to us. And now we're basically planning for a mass casualty. Um, the way that we dealt with it is we started with the planning a few, um, a, a few months ago. And then this actually gave us a great opportunity to work with the medicine folks because um, in the past we used to be more working in silos, medical ICU, surgical ICU, neuro ICU have been working together and um, creating these guidelines together um, so we can help each other. We have um, uh, what we did with created um, a backup of the backup in uh, a circumstance where at some point we could if we get, uh, if our system gets tested, we can have a few surgeons that are not really intensivists, but that they can consult uh, critical care. We roll the um, uh, the SCCM um, and modules that are really simple. It's like really basic critical care, 10 minutes lectures for people that want to refresh in what they uh, remember for critical care. And then we just wrote it down. We created protocols. We have the protocol of COVID patient in the ICU, the hypoxia protocol, the proning protocol, the CPR, and we publish it in several places so there's not a problem of people not finding it or not knowing where they are. And we make sure that those protocols were um, approved and seen by all, by anesthesia, by medicine, by everybody. We have the CRNS. The CRNS is also helping us with critical care, which is uh, going to be important. And I just think it's highlighted the opportunity for collaboration and uh, respect for what each all of us do. I think, again, among the, I mean, I don't, I, of course, it's not great that we're in a pandemic, but among the lessons that we're learning is, is uh, helping each other, trusting each other, learning from each other, having the respect of what everybody has expertise on. And, um, and, you know, it's also how we work in communicating um, the things that we have agreed upon so we can serve our patients better. Are these modules optional? You put them out there for people or is there some structured requirement for education? We put them optional, but this is what, I, like, at least in my experience, I found out. When um, people might just see them as optional when you don't know, when you're not sure that you're going to be taking care of that patient. The moment that your intensive care unit starts getting positive COVID patients, people are, are going to want to do that and refresh it. You're not going to have to mandate anything. You're not going to, we didn't have to mandate that people learn how to uh, use PPE and appropriate wash your hands. They, everybody wanted to learn and wanted to know and wanted more information because they know that in knowledge is how, how they take care of themselves and, uh, and their patient. I think once the moment of stress comes, people are going to be wanting to learn. It's going to be less of an obligation and more like a, um, desired. I think some of the messages we've heard in this interview series are be prepared as far in advance as possible and getting people stimulated to understand it's coming. It sounds like you've put the groundwork in place for it, which isn't surprising given uh, what everyone knows about your leadership skills, that you're, you're getting everybody ready to pitch in and roll up their sleeves and help out as necessary. So thanks for doing that. Uh, I appreciate your time and expertise today. Uh, grateful to you for the role you play in, in, in YFA as well as uh, in the world of trauma and in the American College of Surgeons. So thank you for your time uh, and efforts. I wish you and your loved ones um, health and safety throughout this pandemic and, and look forward to again seeing you in person at an ACS meeting when this uh, affair is all behind us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. The last thing that I wanted to emphasize is that I, the same way that we collaborate with anesthesia and with medicine and wherever, for everybody else, we have to learn from each other. There's a lot of people that have gone through difficult times already. And even though it might not be published now in a randomized control trial, you, we have to benefit from the experience of, of each other, right? People that are in New York, they know the issues that they have with sedation or the issues that they have with infectious disease. and Together, talking to each other is how we find better answers for our patients. Communication is indeed essential. Thank you, sir. Thanks again. Stay well. You too.